Welcome to Ever Beyond Beyond Broadcast through the Wolf Spirit Media Network. Be prepared to leave your belief systems behind as we go beyond teachers, beyond gurus, beyond duality, ever beyond beyond. Please join us in the chat room at www.wolfspiritradio.com forward slash listen. You're listening to Wolf Spirit Radio. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, and welcome to Ever Beyond. <laughs> we have a major B uh, show today. Um, we are uh, going to be talking Shungite. We're going to be talking honey, and we're going to be talking bees, all in the same paragraph. My guest tonight is Derek Condit. Uh, I, don't, I hope that's how you pronounce your name. Um, and uh, recently um, contacted me to uh, to say, hey, I've got some honey that I've made with Shanghai. And I thought, how the hell does that work? Well, I better invite him on the show to ask him those very questions. And so, uh, without any further ado... Good afternoon, Derek. How are you? I'm doing very well, JP. Thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Um, I've uh, I've uh, tried some of your honey. It's rather delicious. It's very. It's uh, it's. It, what's in, interesting? You know, um, you buy commercial honey. It's got this kind of burning thing at the back of the throat. Um, and, uh, your honey doesn't have that. It's very, it's, it's got a really mild flavor. So, um, well, maybe you, it, it, it's part of the, uh, the thing of it. Um, but, uh, so would you like to introduce yourself to, to my audience, uh, who are, um, oh, I can't think of any, <laughs> who are waiting, uh, uh, very patiently and, uh, wondering what all this is about. So, bees, honey, shungai, how does it work? How do you, do you, do you just, just throw, throw the stones at him? <laughs> <laughs> sure. No, it's a little bit different than that. Um, well, I'm a relatively new beekeeper. I've done it for just a couple of years now. And in our first year, we actually experienced some of that colony collapse disorder that many have probably heard about. Um, it's, it's pretty prevalent in this area. But... And I, at about the same time frame, I discovered Shungites on, on the Internet, did a lot of research, watched a lot of shows on it, um, basically got real drawn to it. So I thought, well, you know, why not why not try it with the honey or whatnot? And I actually started working with another group, CosmicReality.net, and we take the stones and we actually put them at the entrance of the beehive. And, and so the bees are, you'd think, on, on beehives, typically when there's something foreign on their hive, they try and get rid of it. They'll try and remove it, push it out of there or whatnot, but they don't do that with the shungite. So we thought, well, let's get the shungite there and see how it affects the bees. And I didn't really give too much thought to the honey thinking that it would have an effect on it. But as you mentioned in the beginning, that lack of a bite in the back of your throat when you eat the shungite honey, it's it's definitely missing from it. So, And, and that's one of the first things we noticed. So with the nuggets, they're... Oh, I don't know, probably a couple ounces each. And we put them at the entrance, like I mentioned. And we, we kind of see it as the, as the quantum field. So as the shungite produces quantum field around, it's protecting the bees from not only the environmental radiation, but Wi-Fi signals, EMF signals. And it's, it definitely helps in the, um, the longevity of the bees, their health. I've taken various devices out there, EMF readers, um, Geiger counters and checked the the ambient radiation and EMF signals before we put the shungite, and then we we'll put the shungite there and and check it after. And there's there's a definite difference. Um, and then as we went off for a couple months this summer, and the honey started being produced, we noticed that well, as we, as we tasted a little bit of the honey, it was pretty clear. It was it was the clearest honey we'd ever seen before because the honey can often come in real dark, golden colored, but this was almost white. And then also that lack of a bite that you had mentioned. So um, our next step was actually we got some of the shungite powder mixed in with a paint, 
and we painted the beehives with it. So think sort of Faraday cage around the beehive. So that's an ongoing experiment we're doing at the moment. So we're actually doing quite a bit with them. Right. So you, you, um, okay. So first of all, let me, let me just start ask, are you outside by any chance? Um, I'm by, I'm where it's windy. Is that the problem? Yeah. I got, there's a lot of wind and uh, distortion on your voice. So, um, if you, uh, you can back up, um, a little bit from the mic and, um, and if you can find a, a nice quiet place, that, that'd be better. So, so you, how's, you're, how's this? That's better. That's, that's a lot better. The, so you, you've been painting, um, now, uh, a few, a few years ago, I did some experiments with, um, I got some PVA glue and I, I didn't have any actual proper shungite powder, but I did have the, the stuff that was at the bottom of the bag, you know, all the crumbs and stuff. So I stuck that and um I I painted the back of my phone on the inside um with that and that seemed to to work quite well. Uh I mean there was loads of it, you know, it's, it's not a tiny amount like the like we're using these days but uh um that was so so you you basically painted the inside or a part of it or or what what did uh, have you tried okay. and, and and also have you tried doing things like um painting half of it and or, you know, doing something like a blind double experiments. Okay. Um, yeah, actually, we have several beehives. We have six up and running now. We we had some of them painted. And to answer the first part, we paint the outside because you want to leave the inside of a beehive natural wood so that there's no chemicals off-gassing from the paint during the summer or anything like that. So you, you actually paint the outside. And we do the entire hive so that, as I mentioned, it's kind of in an enclosed box of the shungite. So there wouldn't be any penetration of the EMF signals. Um, and I'm, what else did you ask? So yeah, yeah painting. Uh, I was using PVA glue. What did? What, how did you make your shungite paint? Did you just pour some, get some white paint, and pour the black stuff in? Okay, yeah, yeah. And um, and we did the same thing at first before we got some of the shungite powder from Cosmic Rail. We had we had the powder from the bottom of the bag as well, and that should work just fine. We just mixed it in with um, an exterior enamel paint from your local Home Depot or whatnot. I mix it in. It'll change the color for sure. It'll darken it, turn it kind of a greenish hue, and then just pretty much coat the outside of the beehives with it. Okay, so that's cool. So you've got um, now. Uh, are you have you been uh, experimenting with beehives as well? I, you know, I, I was uh, a follower of um, uh, Anastasia's work. Have you heard about this? I'm sure you have. Yeah, I have. Actually, we're going to try and build one of those beehives this winter. They're um, kind of uh, for the audience, I'm trying to explain it. So think of a a log maybe cut in half, so a few feet long, and you kind of hollow it out and prop it up at maybe a 30 or 40-degree angle, and then the bees will go in there. So we're going to build one of those. It's a little more difficult to harvest honey out of that because you don't have removable frames that you can just grab and pull out. But we're more about propagating the bees anyway. So that's a great way to go ahead and get queens to be produced and um, release them in the wild. Another thing we did with the powder was took little coin trays, little plastic trays that maybe you'd put a silver dollar in for storage and open them up and put about a gram of powder in those trays at the entrance of the beehives. And we did this just to a couple of them um, for testing purposes. The bees were definitely drawn to it. There's even a video on the website, shungaihoney.com, of them doing this. They'll, they'll crawl through the trays. You can see it stick into their legs, and they'll go in the hive as well as fly several miles from the hive to collect their pollen and nectar, thus spreading the sh- in the general area as well. So you're basically getting them to um, to distribute the shungite powder like pollen. That's very interesting. Have, have you seen That's what exactly happens what to, to, to the flowers? Has that changed anything? I suppose it's, it's too early to tell. Um, yeah, yeah, it's too early to tell. But what the thing we can't tell is... Because we harvested last year at different times, and throughout the year, there's different flowers, of course, blooming. That'll color the nectar coming back and color the honey. We've had none of that this year compared to last year. All the honey's coming back nearly clear. So I, it's, you know, it's hard to say what's causing that, but that's a definite difference we've noticed. And the other good thing that Shungite has, and I have nothing else to attribute it to, is the lack of, at the beginning I mentioned no colony collapse disorder, and we also have no pests or disease of any kind on any of the beehives, which is real unusual. And uh, do you normally get something in a year? 
Absolutely. We'll use generally in this area, you lose about 40 to 50 percent of your hives for one reason or another, um, be it mites or just various bee sickness. Um, and often you don't even know what's doing it. But yes, that's that happens pretty much a guarantee every year until now. And I haven't changed anything else other than the shungite. Right. So shungite paint on the outside, shungite stones. And, um, um, little, uh, how did you do? Just, um, just spread the powder at the beginning, at the entrance of the hive? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just put, um, actually 0.7 grams and we log all this on the Facebook group, Shungite Beehives, where mm-hmm. I'll put a little bit of the powder in there in a tray and then you'll see the bees actually will just walk through it and it sticks to their, their legs. Sorry about the sirens go by. Um, it'll stick to their legs and they'll carry it inside the hive and spread it around as well as outside. And bees will go, depending on how much or how many flowers are blooming, um, they'll go up to seven miles from the hive to get their pollen and honey they need. All right. So um, now, remind me where you are in the uh, on the Turtle Island. Sure. We're up in uh, Snohomish County, Washington State, so in the Puget Sound, so at the very top portion of uh, the U.S. All right. And uh, are you plagued by fire at the moment? There seems to be a lot of fire on the West Coast. Yeah, that's exactly just what you heard. We have um, fire crews going by, and there's several not too far from us going on right now. So, yeah, quite a few. All right. Um, are, have you moved away from your your uh, your router? You're um, you're losing signal slightly. Um, sorry about that. Um, no, actually, I'm not moving at all. But we do live in the mountains, so it wouldn't surprise me if I actually lost connection. To be honest. All right. Okay. So. Um, okay. Uh, Interesting. So, Shungai, how does, how does, have have you done any research on how and on the hows and whys or the, um, the deeper effects of what Shungai does to the bees or is it just like this is it? Well, I don't suppose there's very much research anyway. Is there? Did the Russian, have the Russians done any? Uh, that's interesting. We're having trouble finding that out because of translation issues. So we don't, I, I try and look, and I'll do the Google translation, but I'm not finding anything specifically being done with bees or honey with Shungite anywhere. So as far as we can tell, you know, we're the first. Um, it's definitely having an effect. There, there are a lot of people interested online that are that are contacting us, and we're trying to get them the Shungite to put on their hives so we can see if it's the nuggets that are having the major effect or the powder or the paint or all the above. Um, but it's it definitely helps the bees, so that's that's great. So... Aside from uh, their uh, being, you know, being uh, protected in some way from the colony collapse, which presumably is some kind of toxic effect, um, <laughs> how do you how do you tell where the bees are happy? Is there is I mean is there a is there an emotional quotient with 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 these creatures? I mean, they're very intelligent, you know, and their hive mind and all of this stuff. Can you tell if uh, a hive is happy or sad or anxious or, or anything like that? Yeah, actually, you can tell all of that. Um, you can it just as you're walking out on them, you can get a sense. So as you're approaching the hives, let's let's for example, if they're upset, if something maybe a possum or raccoon got by and annoyed them, they're going to start bouncing off of your forehead. So they'll actually fly up to you hit you right in the forehead and bounce off and just continue to do that. So that's an obvious sign that they're a little upset about something. Um, but if you're going out on a normal day and nothing has upset them, you can just, it, depending on the per- person, of course, you can just feel it. So there's the energy there. But then also you can go up and listen to it, and you'll hear the hum or the buzz of the hive. And there's different frequencies to that. So there'll be higher rate ones, and you can tell that they're really excited and something's going on in there. Maybe they're producing queens or... Maybe there's a robbing situation going on. So you can see it. You can feel it. You can walk up. And, and, I mean, hear it. But you can walk up and see it as well because the bees will kind of prop their back ends up at the entrance and and shake. And sometimes you'll see them wrestle there at the entrance. If maybe a, a neighbor bee came by, to, as I mentioned, robbing before. So it's, it's pretty apparent when they're upset or if they're happy. That's all bees too. Because I'll go up there and just sit in front of them. If any beehive come a few packs, they can get in, but they'll land on you. You can pick them up, hold them. They're calm. They're just kind of doing their thing. So it's it's pretty evident on their on the how they're feeling. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. I'm sort of quite 
um, taken by the idea of having bees, um, uh, and mainly, uh, and, and also because there's been so much um, uh, loss of the bees, and this this famous thing that uh, Steiner said, you know, if you lose the bees, we got four years, and um, that you know, there's a lot about it. It's a very symbiotic relationship we have with them and it's not just about honey is it oh no no they help keep us alive here um i think it was stated they do 80 something percent of our pollination of the fruits and vegetables we eat so they're they're really important um and and the honey if is the one food that an insect makes that we can eat there's no other um creature that we can actually go out there and just grab this one food from them and it has everything we need to sustain life, be it the water percentage and the nutrients as well. So that's a little interesting. Isn't it? And um, it is a very kind of, it's really close knit. Uh, although, you know, there are other creatures that are like honey, <laughs> bears like honey. Um, as you say, possum, you know, most other creatures like that sweet stuff, don't they? Oh yeah. It's, it's one of nature's most, you know, obviously the one of the sweetest foods there are. Yeah. It's a, it's loved by everybody out there. You'll, depending on where you live, you'll have the bear issues, the possums, the, the raccoons. And in this area, mice, um, are an issue. So you have to put little mouse guards on there so they can't get through and get the honey because they want their share. Okay. So mice as well. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, tell us, tell us about your story then, Derek. What, you know, how did you get into this? Sure. Um, I've always had a draw to bees for for some reason. I wasn't sure why. I've, I've researched them throughout the years, looked into them, always waited for a place where I live where I could have them because I thought, well, you need a lot of land to do this. Um, and you really don't. Our, our hives, we have six of them at the moment, probably 50 feet from our front door, and we don't have issues with them coming and attacking our pets or us or anything. So I, I looked into bees, researched for a couple of years, and, and I would have thinking back, I wouldn't have probably done that. I would have probably just jumped in with both feet because it's not as intimidating as many people think. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate for those out there that are thinking about it. So I got my first hive a couple of years ago. You can go to local beekeepers and get what's called a nook, which would be a starter hive. It's, it's about a, think of a half a, a half a beehive. It comes with a queen, some bees and a few frames to start with. So we started with that. Um, I just was really drawn to it, like I mentioned, interested. They were a lot of fun, had no problems. And then that one hive started spreading. Um, and then just as we understood shungite and we started tying all of that together, just started the various experiments um, and trying to, try to see how that works out. And so far it's done real well. I'm Right now we started this season with two hives. We went up to eight um, from just those two, from just – Hyper expansion, they supersede, meaning they'll make new queen cells and, and start new hives from there, um, new colonies. And if you catch them, you can put them in a hive. We've had a couple of swarms we've caught this year. So I'm actually a full-time state correctional officer for 15 years now. And so I do the beekeeping as a, a side job, believe it or not, um, after I do that. So it, it keeps me pretty busy. Indeed. So, uh, now, in our pre, yeah, you know, we, we haven't had much of a conversation. Uh, we, we we had a little back and forth, and um, uh, you're not just a beekeeper, are you? No, no, I'm a I'm a what's called a prison guard, a, a correctional officer. So I I work nighttime at, at one of the state prisons here in Washington. Uh, do that full time, and then I'll come home during the day and and do my beekeeping. Um, so it's it's it keeps me pretty busy. Fabulous, and and <laughs> I don't suppose it's that there's. Are there any parallels? Well, actually, there's going to be soon. Or the person I'm at is looking to bring in, starting their own bee. Um, it's it's called an apiary, so they're going to put a few beehives back at, at one of the sections of the prison, and I'll be taking those over and, and instructing some of the inmates on the ins and outs of beekeeping, and hopefully they get a, a career or some knowledge for when they they get released. Um, so that, that, that would be the only tie in really, but we are trying to do that. So it's, that should be interesting. Now, now this would be interesting. Um, would, 
uh, if you then started introducing the bees and then started introducing shungite, I wonder what effect that might have on the prison life and uh, whether that might cause some amelioration of something. Uh, that's that's a good point, and I thought exactly that. But mm. because it is a prison, mm. I can't exactly walk in with um, unauthorized items. But the way around that would be possibly paint the beehives yeah. before they're put back there. So and, and see how that goes. So that's that's interesting. Yeah, that would be a, an, an interesting little thing. Um, I know that in Russia they've been experimenting with pyramids. And not just your cheops, uh, sort of the low aspect, but, uh, the quite a pointy one, like a church spire almost. And, uh, they had some, uh, prison inmates. Um, now what did they do? They, they put a, a load of, uh, uh, what we call breeze blocks, cinder blocks, you know, the um, building material, building bricks. And, um, they put them inside the pyramid. And as I said, they're, they're, they're not like the Cheops pyramid, the low, low aspect is quite a pointy aspect. And, um, they also, uh, uh, they were just made of fiberglass and, and, uh, plastic or something like that. So it's just the shape. But, uh, when they brought these breeze blocks and made cells out of them, again, cells, you know, <laughs> it's connected. Um, they found that the prisoners were a lot calmer and they, you know, they, they, uh, they were, um, it helped them in some ways, some, you know, uh, to, uh, what's that word? Rehabilitate themselves. So that, that would be a very interesting thing just to, just to see what, that, what that was like in the future. But, uh, for the moment, you, you've got, uh, you, you just, the, the, <laughs> the only inmates you have are, uh, in, in the boxes outside. Um, so how many hives have we got? Um, we've got six now. We just condensed down from eight because a couple were relatively new ones. And because we're going to start to approach the fall and winter time here, you need the – it's called a brood bowl when they're inside of the hive. So mm. they'll kind of hunker together in the size of a basketball and keep each other warm and the queen warm. So because two of them were a little bit smaller, I condensed them into two other hives and joined them. And there's no problem really doing that. So we've cut down to six hives for this winter. You mentioned the pyramids. We are working with Walt Silver on, he sent us a couple of those, the, the, the taller ones you're talking about. Um, we have, I don't know, two or three inches tall, Shungite pyramids that he's made. Um, and there are, we're doing a couple of side studies on that on one of the hives as well. Yes, he has a, it, yeah. a resin based, um, Shungite, uh, uh, it's kind of like a cross between organite and Shungite really, isn't it? It's like, uh, exactly. Shungite held in a matrix of, uh, of, uh, resin. And, um, yeah, so he's got these, uh, he's got these tall pyramids as well. So have, have, the, have you, I mean, have they only just arrived? Have you not had a chance to, uh, see what they're doing? Um, no, we've had them. We've had them on. The thing is on the hive that it's on because we're not, we're doing different studies on different hives, but on the one that's on, it's, it's, it's a newer hive, meaning younger. So they haven't expanded enough for say to extract honey because they're making enough honey. We won't take honey from a hive unless they have more than enough for their winter stores, it's called, because we don't believe in feeding the bees, anything foreign, no sugars, no syrups, none of that. Um, we believe the honey's theirs, and if there's extra, then we can extract some of that. So the hive we're talking about with the pyramid hasn't reached that level yet, so I haven't been able to extract honey, but as far as their health and vitality, it's off the charts as well as all the others. They're, there's just no sickness or disease, again, of any kind, so they're doing real well. Right. Well, I mean, that, this is the, the, you know, a really good, uh, selling point just to start with that it will, um, it will, uh, keep them healthy and happy. Uh, like you were saying, you know, it is possible to see if they're happy or not and, uh, and whether they're healthy. Um, now regard, regarding the honey itself, um, as I said, it's very light. Um, it flows very nicely. Um, in a, in a light way, it's not like a heavy syrup. It's uh, quite a light, um, a light flow, uh, as it were. Um, its taste is mild and sweet. Um, I've only had it a few days, so I can't really say if it's had any um, effect on me. This uh, particularly, um, there was another another product that you sent me, which is in a little hexagonal jar. You would talk about that. Sure. Yeah, we're we're trying to work on, a, and that's actually a, kind of a sample one. We're still working it out, but that's our sh- we're so far calling it Shungite skin balm. So we've mixed in Shungite powder with our 
organic Shanghai honeycomb um, beeswax. So we have the Shanghai beeswax mixed with the Shanghai powder and then a little bit of the uh, Shanghai honey. So a whole lot of Shanghai in there. And what we're using that topically. So it's been sent out to various people. They're using it for you know, everything from eczema to psoriasis to um, dry skin, all sorts of things. So it's it's working really well. We're still working that out, trying to see what the best uses are for it. But uh, the feedback thus far is great. Um, and it helps with, of course, dry patches or whatnot um, and your, your standard skin issues. Uh, but we're really happy with that Shanghai Balm. We're just trying to find new uses for it. All right. Well, let me just, uh, I'm just going to have a quick look. Because um, last night I woke up and I, I, I had this uh, big scab on my... Um, on my uh my leg there I was, it was, well it's it's kind of re- it's really dried it up it was uh it was open and and uh moist yesterday and it's all nice and dry now um a little bit of pinkness but uh it's uh it certainly accelerated its healing quite nicely so um so it's uh <laughs> as far as i can tell um it uh it was because i'm in scotland so it's quite cold here um it it, it re- remains quite hard i don't know how it is over over there it's pretty hot right now so it's it's in the probably low 90s um and on the honey um there's a lot of um ailments that people are doing with the honey itself from helping preemptively treat their cataracts mixing it with a water mixture and dropping it in their eyes we're actually doing that ourselves with our dogs um, in addition to us, and then the honey again for for wounds, for burns, for all sorts of things. From it'll kill MRSA, um, all sorts of the bacteria. So it's it's like a a last ditch go to when antibiotics um, won't treat various issues. So there's a lot of people doing it for that, and then internally, of course, as well. Okay, so now. Um before before the show started, I don't know if you noticed in the chat room, there was somebody talking about various grades of Shungite. Now, myself, I've only heard of two, you know, regular Shungite and Shungite Elite. Um, do you know anything about um, what's the difference between Elite Shungite and regular Shungite, for a start? Well, you've got me on that one because we're only working with the regular. Um, so I'm not real. I have a little bit of elite sitting around here, but as far as working with the beehives, we're just using the regular and, and that seems just fine. The, the results we're getting with that are, are, are pretty crazy. So uh, we haven't even tried the elite. So unfortunately, I don't have much input on that one. All right. Well, um, in, in my experience, the elite is like, um, it's like glass and it shatters. When you scratch it, here, take a little experiment. Get a magnifying glass and set it up so you can see, you know, get one of these little worker things. And take, uh, do you have any, uh, do you have any elite? I do. Yeah, I have okay. a piece right here. So take, take a little, um, like a stainless steel or something, um, a metal scraper and just scrape the surface a little bit. Uh, and what you will see is very unusual. It, um, it doesn't like fling off little bits don't just fling off it turns to a smoke which means that the um the material is is shattering to a very very fine powder and then just literally floating away because it's light in the air i'm doing it as we speak right now i get a magnifying glass yeah. just... <laughs> so, so wild eric yeah. is, is doing this so uh if if you have any shungite uh shungite elite and you know um, it's, you will never find a piece of Shungite Elite that's, uh, cut or polished, um, because you can't, <laughs> you just, you just basically can't. It will turn into a very, very fine powder, like, um, now what is it? What is that thing? It's, it's got a funny name. What happens when you drop, um, molten glass into water? It's called yeah, some, I'm trying to think of it shards, some, maybe shards. No, that's no, it's called like something like St. Anthony's nodule or something. Anyway, you, basically if you drop water, if you drop, um, hot glass into water, it will solidify. And, um, then when you, uh, when you, uh, crunch it, any part of it with a pair of pliers, it will entirely turn to powder. The whole thing. It will just completely shatter to, 
billions of pieces. And Shanghai Elite is kind of like that. It's got a, um, a very glass-like structure rather than the kind of rock-like stuff that we, uh, and, um, regular Shanghai is quite soft, isn't it? Quite a, quite a soft powder. Yeah, there's a big difference between the two. Mm. So, um, now, uh, John here now was talking about, uh, Sangha is a polarizing mineral with positive swing to any fluid that is brought near to it, but should it be inhaled or eaten? I doubt at this time it might be a Trojan horse. Um, I can answer part of that, actually, John, is that, um, you can buy powdered shungite held in an olive oil suspension uh and it does have many uh health benefits so yeah it can be ingested but i wouldn't do it with uh with with elite because uh it's i, I don't know what the particles of elite are going to look like but they might be a bit sharp yeah so anyway that's yeah i'd be hesitant yeah, yeah. i wouldn't do that either with yeah. elite so um there's there's elite <laughs> so I, i'll just answer that uh, what other questions, um, that we have? I'm just looking back through the chat room here. Um, what, uh, how, yeah, well, first of all, um, have you, have you got, um, much of a clientele, as it were? Uh, yeah, actually, that's, that's grown pretty rapidly. Uh, there's a lot of people interested. We've got, I'm not even sure what we're at now, but several people throughout the U.S., um, that are starting their own beehives and they're going to try and replicate and see what results they have. So they're going to start new ones. And it's just, it's, it's really amazing how there's zero pests and disease. Again, that's, that's just really the amazing part and how, how healthy they're doing. So we want to spread that out as far and wide as we can. There's um, a couple other countries, well, in yours, Scotland as well, there's somebody there that, that might start a hive. So we're hoping that happens. Um, and hopefully people will share their results on that. Shanghai Beehives project on Facebook, and then we all get to kind of work off of each other and, and see what benefits the bees the most. Because this is really about the bees, not not the honey. So we're not really extracting too much honey. Um, again, we have to leave their winter stores for them before we take any. But hopefully, we help the bee population, mm. which in turn is helping all of us. Absolutely. So, uh, would you thank your bees personally <laughs> for for the samples that you sent? That was. Uh... <laughs> So, uh, you know, cause, uh, you know, you, you hear these stories, you know, it takes one bee, you know, or, or if you have a teaspoon of, um, a teaspoon of honey, it's like one entire bee's entire lifetime's work. So, um, it's, you know, it's, it's like it, a tenth of a teaspoon. Yeah. It's really, it's really small. Really? Uh, it's, it's even smaller than that. It's pretty crazy. And there's about 50,000 bees per hive and those numbers rotate. They only live a few weeks depending on which type of bee we're talking about. All right. So, um, so I'm plagued by a uh, little midgy insects here over here. Uh, mites. Can you use diatomaceous earth with bees? Are they, are they big enough to be not harmed by it? Now that's interesting. I do have some of that around here. We use it for, um, internal issues with some of our animals. I'd, I'd maybe be a little hesitant to have them walk around through it because it is so jagged and I'd worry about it maybe, you know, as it gets rid of the internal parasites, that's what it does is kind of cuts them a little bit. So I'd be hesitant because of that. Um, but we don't, we don't have the mite issue. We did last year and all my, the, the other hives that are here locally have mites and they have no SEMA. Just think of a, a stomach flu for the bee. Um, so they have that as well. And we had that last year in our hives, but because we have nothing, we don't even need nothing as far as disease or pest. We don't have to worry about the treatments at all, so that's that's a great benefit. Ah, so it's a bit like the um, the the pests and things like that are attracted to, I, I, hmm, or they're, they're repelled by the shunga. It seems. Yeah, it actually does seem that way, um, and that, that's why we're, we're all working with Cosmic Reality on the Bee Project, like I said. And if you contact them, they'll actually send you the shunga for your hives. And it's, I think it's a, a, a combination of that and then just the bees being so healthy, they're able to, it, let's say a mite did get in there, they're able to extract it before it's able to propagate and, and kind of go crazy in there. So it's, it's worth working out on all levels, really. All right. Excellent. Um, uh, somebody's saying, uh, do you mean, um, 
elite Shanghai, several names. There's several names, but um, noble Shanghai or elite Shanghai or, uh, you know, uh, what's the word? Um, what other words do they have for elite there, uh, Derek? I know there's noble, noble and elite too. Those are the only two I mm-hmm. know of. Yeah, and they're just, we're saying, yeah, mm-hmm. same thing, same thing. Yeah, I would I would use them interchangeably for how we're doing it. So, like I said the Cosmic Crowd is going to send out. We'll send them the nuggets to beekeepers if they're interested, and mm-hmm. it would be the standard ones. Um, and they work fantastic. Fabulous, fabulous. Do you think the um, the bees actually manage to scrape some off the surface and take it in with them? They definitely do that, and, and and remember, I put the powder there as well, so I, I'll actually get up really close because they're in a a really good mood when I put the powder there. So I'll I'll get literally a few inches from it, and and see the powder as they're walking through it, stick to their legs as they're either coming or going. So I know for sure it gets in the hive and outside, and they they transport it around. Indeed, that's fabulous. So they're um they're <laughs> they're spreading the word as well, as it were. <laughs> yeah, and they're helping the environment because as they get this, I see it as they get the shungite spread within, as I mentioned, up to seven miles, depending on your 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 growth of your flowers. Um, the shungite's being spread far and wide here as well, so it's, it's helping on lots of levels. Oh, that's brilliant! So now more questions from Vanessa. Have you tried to put some shungite around a honey jar from other hives that don't have shungite? Does that make any difference? Okay, I have done that. I've gotten other uh, a local organic. We're, we're all organic, so we believe in no chemicals, no treatments, as I mentioned before. Again, no feeding um, either. So we got another organic beekeeper's honey. Actually put a nugget in there, and we've had it around it. It had no effect that, that I could tell. We've checked the pH on it, um, the flavor, and it has that distinct, as I see the negative bite in the back of your throat that you don't have to have with honey, but people are so normal, you know, used to that, they think it should be there. Um, but it didn't change any of that really having it around somebody else's honey. So it seems to be it, the shungite needs to be there while the bees are making the honey so that it's in that field the entire time. And our queens, because we're shungite queens, we've gone through generations now, our newer, as we're calling them, shungite queens, are are being born in these shungite hives so that the genetics are are through their entire life being in that field. So there's no chance of them, as we see, you know, getting sick, and they haven't done that yet. We're we're actually going to start selling Shungite Queens next spring uh, to ship out so people can start their own hives as well. Well, this is the thing. um, You you, you mentioned earlier a special word for um, a kind of uh, beginner's hive thing. Can you repeat that word so that people... You know, I hope that this show will actually inspire lots of other people to uh to start beehiving and um <laughs> start beehiving mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway um to uh yeah, sure. to start uh with their um with their bee collection and maybe experiment with uh with the uh, shungai and uh, other things but certainly at least to have bees because like we were still talking about before we really need bees Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was called a, a nook, an N-U-C. So if, let's say if I was somebody who wanted to get started in bees, I would get online, contact your local beekeeping association, Craigslist. You'll, you'll find them everywhere. Um, and then you can find someone like myself that will sell you a nook. And it's basically, again, a, a, a beehive, in essence, cut in half with five frames in it. So they'll give you, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe 10,000 bees to start with, and there'll be a queen in there, and then a couple of those frames are called, they have the honeycomb on it, will have brood in them, which are the cells that have eggs and larvae to help the, the bees, you know, continue on. So they'll sell you that for between two and three hundred dollars, and then you'll take that nook box, or nook beehive, however you want to look at it, home, and as they start to expand, you'll move them in pretty rapidly into a full-size beehive, which is twice that size, if you use what's called a Langstroth. There's lots of beehives, but we use um, a 10-frame Langstroth, and that's pretty common. And then you move them in there, and they'll just start to expand rapidly, and as as they fill up the frames with honey, nectar, brood, whatnot, you just start adding your boxes uh, from there. And then as they, as they need queens, they'll do what's called supersede, and as they do that, they'll swarm, and you can Go ahead and catch that swarm and start another hive. So really that nook that we're talking about is just the start. And then if, and as we found out, once you add the shungite, they stay healthy and they'll propagate real well and start making additional queens. And then you just catch those queens, various ways of doing that. 
um, or taking the queen cell out, the, the egg, or um, before she hatches and move her into a new hive. That way you don't have to go buy a, another nook from someone. But you really only need the one to start with. And uh, how much would you say? I mean, uh, I know in, in dollars um, we can sort of va- vaguely trans- translate that. But um, what sort of, what, you know, what's the pro- sort of starting price? Uh, you know, how much would it cost to set up a, a small hive for yourself? Okay. Um, well, for here in the U.S., you can go to any any. It's called a co-op or a farm store, um, something like that, and you get a starter box that comes with everything you need for probably. $150 or so, maybe 200 depends if it comes with a, a suit to wear. But you can get that, and that's all you need to start, and then go to your local beekeeper, get that nook, and put it in there. And, again, I mentioned our hives are about 50 feet from our front door, and a, a maximum of eight of them this year with no problems. So you don't need a lot of room uh, to keep these beehives. And they don't. it's not like you walk out there and there's a swarm of bees attacking you all the time. We don't have that problem. Um, and then after that, Often those little kits I was just talking about come with the, the smoker you need, and they'll come with the various frames and, and inner lids and bottom. But that's just a really good starter kit. So for the two to three hundred for the bees, depending where you live, and then the hundred and fifty for the the base bottom of the hive to start with, you know, four hundred fifty dollars or so. And then if you're doing it for honey, you'll start buying additional boxes, honey supers they're called, and they're a little bit sh- shallower than the initial brood box where the bees actually have their brood, their eggs. And you'll start stacking those up as they fill them with honey if, if you're in it for honey. Oh, wow. So you get lots of, uh, oh, there it is. I mean, I mean, there's a, there's a tune that I, uh, I wrote several years ago and I was, I'm looking for the, uh, for the tune for, uh, for the, for the middle part of the show. And, uh, it's called A Drone in the Bee Collective. It's a strange little tune, but anyway, <laughs> so, so everybody's going to get it. Uh, I, I like to be thematic, you know, I like to have a bit of theme. Um, so we're a bit, about 10 minutes from the top of the hour. Um, so here's another question from John here now. Peter the Great used to order, order it for his so- soldiers in battle. Mm, try again. Peter the Great used to order it for his soldiers in battle to use in their water bottle. He is also known to go into battle riding naked on his source, and when killing the opposition in the final act, he would beastly ride them before chopping their head off. <laughs> Might it be the Shungai in the water? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Shungai, not um, not uh, honey. All right. <laughs> yeah, I thought that too for a second. And then they had them exiled in a place in North Holland after his reign. Hmm. <laughs> so, I, I don't really know what you can say to that, really, eh, Derek? <laughs> I was thinking for, wait, is he talking about he rubbed shunga or honey all over himself? I thought that's a little odd. Well, you know what these Russians are like. I don't know. <laughs> ah, right. So, there we go. Yeah, I can do, um, if, if anybody wants, um, uh, shunga elite in the European zone, um, uh, get to my website ever beyond radio and I, I, I can do a bucky bag. Um, just say in, in, in the little note saying, uh, make it as an elite bucky bag and, uh, I can put, uh, elite in it rather than the, um, rather than the, uh, uh, rather than the, uh, regular, uh, bucky bags. So, um, just looking for more, more, uh, questions here. Alright, no. Um, it is, oh yes, there we go. Um, this is from Wizard, uh, from the universe. Would any other crystals or stones work as well as Shunga? Have you tried any other crystals? Okay, I have. I haven't talked about it before, but that's a good question. On one of the hives, there's a, um, a double terminated quartz crystal on top of it. It's, now, I can't say that I'm seeing any difference, but it is, and, and as I understand it, within the same field, it, because it's close to the other beehives, I think it's still going to be in the same Shungite field, um, as, as we'll term it. So the Shungite could be having an effect on that as well, but there's there's no notable difference between that beehive and the Shungite ones other than, well, no difference. They're all doing well, let's put it that way. And they're expanding. We've had, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know how many queens we've had, um, made this year that so many have escaped, which is great because now the Shungite queen bees are, are getting out in the Snohomish County area here and, and propagating in the wild, which is what we want. And then we've captured 
two swarms in our local trees and put them in hives. So, and that's one of the ones I tried the crystal on, but again, it is by the other Shungite, so. Fabulous. So, um, yes. I just noticed a question on there yeah, about yeah, the plants. Plants, yes, mm-hmm. indeed. Yeah, I thought you might mention that. Uh, yeah, I, I actually have some of that. Um, uh, again, like I said, we were working with Cosmic Reality on there, so we have some of their powder, and I actually got some of that that I had excess in a little dish because I was cleaning off a couple of the stones, and I poured that, or actually my wife did, Maureen, into some flowers on our front porch. We had two jo- or, uh, two planters of relatively the same size flowers. I, I just didn't want to waste the powder, didn't, wasn't even thinking about you know, it benefiting the plant in any way. Well, it sure did, and we have pictures up on the – Beehive project on Facebook showing that, but it, it probably doubled the growth of the plant in, in the health on the blooms from the flowers. And that was, we, we didn't even think that was going to happen. I had no idea. We just kind of dumped the water and they're not wanting to waste it because it's so hot. And, you know, water shortage and all. So, but no, that makes a difference on the plants. At least the powder. I oh, haven't gone good. and stuck stone, stones out there, but yeah, the powder mixed into the water, that does help. Right. No. I guess I can mention one other um, thing is we have a bird bath and we have video of that as well up there on the website where they show the bees and it, well, it's a bee bird bath now. We have a, a shungite stone in the middle and let's just say they all play well together because these, there'll be maybe a hundred bees at there at a time and the hornets will fly in and they're, they're pretty much mortal enemies. They eat bees that wasps and hornets do and they'll fly away with them. But at the shungite watering hole, as I call it, everybody plays well together. Nobody fights and. So that's kind of interesting, too. And so they're drinking Shungite water is what, what I'm basically telling you. All right. And they're not trying to fight everybody. So it does seem to have um, – the first thing uh, – the first impression that I got with Shungite, you know, ages ago when we first started looking at this, is that it's got a very cool effect. It's cooling. Um, and presumably – and we're gonna, I'm probably going to talk about this in the next hour um, – but uh, – the bees get really warm. Do you think they, uh, and, and, you know, I, I know that there are times when they, you know, kind of line up in the entrance and they're, um, drawing cool air into the hive. Um, does it make them happier? Uh, well, uh, you know, again, again, I'm using these, these qualities. Uh, do you think it helps them stay cool is the question? Um, the Shanghai you're, you're talking? Uh, yeah. Yeah. To the bees. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know if it, if it keeps them cool or not. I, what I'll do is, like, just before the show, I'll go out there and I'll prop open their upper lid. Some of our hives are, oh, probably six stories tall, so six boxes high, um, about six feet or so. And I'll, I'll take the upper lid and put a stick in there so they have ventilation going through it. But as far as keeping it cool, I haven't really given that any thought because I take other measures to keep them cool. Um, but another interesting fact is, like I had mentioned at the beginning, they – Bees often, if there's something foreign in their hive or at the entrance or anything like that, they'll do all they can to remove it. They'll pile up 20 bees on there and push it. If it's a, if a mouse gets in there, they'll kill the mouse inside the hive and then drag them out if they can do it. So they're capable of removing items if they want to. And that's something that, again, they do not do with the Shungai at all. Um, they just leave the nuggets there. And the back on the video thing, we have a video of that where they'll actually just uh, stay around the Shungite nuggets that are at the entrance. They'll walk all over them, so I, I have to think that they're getting small particulates on themselves from the nuggets as well, and that they're really drawn to it. Lovely. It's beautiful. So, look, uh, I'm going to play a tune now. Uh, I wrote it years ago. Um, yes, Norm, it's in 432. Um, <laughs> this tune is... Uh, I, I, I can't remember how it goes. It might be repetitive. It's called A Drone in the Bee Collective. And indeed, a very sharp ending. <laughs> there was a drone in the Bee Collective. Uh, quite a long track, but uh, plenty of um, plenty of repetition. Just like, you know, imagine, that's one bee. He's just going backwards and forwards to the flowers, backwards and forwards to the flowers, just so you can have that coffee and you know, that honey in your tea. My guest tonight on Ever Beyond is Derek Condit from Shungai Honey. Uh, is this is ShungaiHoney.com? Exactly. Exactly. So, 
Um, now we've got a few more uh, questions in there, and I'm, I'm, you're probably all fired up. Did you get inspired? <laughs> Definitely. I'm sitting going through the questions now. That's so um, let's let's go uh, da, 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 up there. I, I, I post there. Okay, so um, here's another one from Energy. Um, have you noticed various plants in the area growing better with the bees and the shungi? Okay, that's a good question. Um, that's hard to answer, though. Our the our garden and plants that are near the hives are definitely doing extremely well. Um, but it, it's really just a tough comparison to make, so I can't really comment on, say, the, the flowers are definitely, oh, that's, my wife just mentioned to me, the flowers have changed. So we have uh, sunflowers. They're about six foot tall where you get sunflower seeds. And what has changed on them is rather than one big sunflower, we probably got six or seven flowers on each stalk. So that has changed. And that was a little unusual. I don't know what to, you know, attribute that. True, again, the only thing that's changed that, that we've done is the shungite. But all of our, and they're probably, I don't know, 20 feet from the hives. So they're not real far. Um, and there's probably a dozen of them that did that. Just started generating multiple flower heads on the stalks for some reason. Um, it's, as far as anything else, so, and then nearby mountains or whatnot, it's really hard to, to have an opinion on that, unfortunately. Okay, so now... Another question from the same uh, Susan. Uh, my neighbor keeps bees. I've been in conversations with her about the idea of keeping bees myself. We live about a 1,000 feet away from each other. That's 350 meters. She's not encouraging in any way. My question, can you have too many beehives in one area? Is that why she's not encouraging me to get my own hives? I'd like to have the honey. Okay, um, no, you can, but it would it would take such a large amount. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of beehives because they'll travel again, like up to seven miles for the pollen and the nectar they need. So that's quite a distance. And unless you're in the middle of the city, you depending, you know, how much growth is out there. So it's it's really relative to where you live. But her neighbor, you say, a thousand feet away, wouldn't or about that, she wouldn't even know she had bees. You wouldn't see them. Um, a trick to do that, so. You, in front of the hive, what I do is I'll put, I have a pile of wood because we have wood burning stove and I'll put the beehives a few feet facing that wood. So as they come out of their hive, that forces them up into the air above head level and above street level because you don't want, if you live near a road, of course you don't want cars driving by and have all your bees on the windshield. So if you put some in front of their hive as they come out, that forces them up and out and bees generally fly southeast. Not always, it just depends what's out there, but generally they'll try and go southeast. So if you orient your hives that way and put some in front, they'll fly up and out and they'll be off your property before they even come down to head level. So your neighbors, you wouldn't even have interactions with them. And then again, as far as numbers, it would be such a large amount that you'd have to be a commercial beekeeper to even have a, a, a notice that at all. Interesting. Lots of bee facts. Uh, Captain Beefheart, and, uh, where are we? Cause we're, uh, nobody fights at the Shungite waterhole. Uh, this is something, now, I don't know if you've heard of Clayton Nolte. I've had him on the show many years ago. No, I haven't. Um, he, he, uh, he deals with, um, uh, structured water, which is water that is counter-rotating in itself. Um, and, uh, it, you get it in rivers when, uh, the reason that river water tastes better than, than tap water is the tap water has been like just shunted down long tubes and it doesn't like it. Um, water likes to spiral, it appears. And it certainly likes a contra, con- counter rotate spiral. Um, and, uh, this is what, uh, Clayton's, uh, water structuring does. So it'd be in- interesting. Uh, what he's got is he's actually got structured water units that incorporate um uh shungite spheres it basically structure water by having um round spherical items in the water flow and it it causes them to spin um and he's got shungite in his you know he's got shungite spheres in his uh in his unit that makes the whole thing uh counter rotate the water so um that would be an, an another layer 
do you use um do you do you feed them water that you know or do they do they just they take their own water and, and do you put shunga in the water have you got a, um an ro filter do you use any kind of filtration talk there lead us through your water supply for the bees Sure. Um, yeah, I've actually dabbled in the destruction of water myself a little bit. I have a frequency generator, and I'll we'll put our water on there and and put 432 through it, um, various ones. So we do that as well, and I've got the Shungite stone in the water. Now, as far as the bees, we do give them water because all all bees need water. You don't want them to have to travel miles to try and find that, that little puddle to drink out of, and you want clean water. So because we're in the mountains, we're actually on well water, so... Again, big chemical-free people. We don't want the fluoride in the water. We don't want the chlorine in the water. And all that affects and transfers into the honey because honey is clearly partially water, 20%. Um, so we give them a, a bird slash bee bath out there just, I don't know, 10 feet from the hives with a large shungite nugget in the middle. So the water's always in around the shungite. So we're, we're calling it shungite water. So they definitely have that, and that's the same spot where everybody gets along, the hornets, bees, wasps, and all of them, and no fighting. Um, so and I don't know whether to attribute that to the Shungite or not, but it definitely is a calm area, and there's no problem. So we do supply the water. Uh, it takes quite a bit of water for the bees to do that. And, again, you don't want them to spend 20% of their life going to get the water to bring it back, to bring in to make the honey. So if you can give it to them and it's clean, it's good. And we don't we do not do any of the filters or anything because of the well water. And I've had it tested, so it's it's real good water. All right, so it's uh, it's straight out the th- straight out the ground, and um, and probably spinning in its right way. Uh, you, you know, when it, when it filters through the through the through the land as well, it's also being forced to spin because it's going round pebbles. It's you know, as, as you're you're aware. Um, yeah, tell tell us a bit about your experience with uh, structured water. Sure. Yeah, I uh, started looking at that a few years ago too. Um, I said, picked up a little, a small frequency generator that just puts out the frequency, no real sound. And we, we'll set our glass on that. Um, let me once. Sec- Sorry, I had to clear my throat. That's okay. What uh, what frequency do you use? Uh, 432 mostly is is what we'll try it um, and do that. We've used that water on plants, so I've done. I'm sure people have seen these various experiments on YouTube. I haven't uploaded my video, but I'll, I'll get plants of the same relative size put some structured water in it, some shungite water in it, some standard water in it, and do those tests. And it definitely pans out. The shungite water makes a difference. The structured water makes a difference as well. And But it's all on the well water, so it's all good water to start with. Um, so we've done that, and it's, I've never taken the plants to fruition, you know, actually grew a tomato from it or anything because it's generally flowers. But it, it makes a difference in their size and, and their well-being. And, it, again, that – is the only thing we changed on the bees is the shungite, and it's it's really odd just how well they're doing. So between plants and bees and, and the water, they're doing fantastic. All right. And um, uh, in terms of the powder, how much do you put on them? Uh, I mean, do you, do you put a regular, like a dosage, like a, a smattering? Do you uh, do you feel that it's uh, you know you give it to them for a while and then give it a rest and give it for a while and then give it a rest or something like that? Do you do you cycle it like that? Okay, and that's that's an unusual part, so I'll tell you about that. The, we actually put that on, we'll call it Shungite Hive number one, and that was the only one we gave the powder to. So it was just under a gram, so a real small amount. I'm not sure what to compare that to, but about the weight of a bee. So we'll put that in there, and we put it on just that one initial hive. And what that did was that, for whatever reason, it – put the hive into overdrive. They started generating queens. And we had another sister hive right next door, exact same nook setup that I'd started with at the beginning of the season. And on the one with the powder, they I, I don't remember exactly. I had a log, but it's four or five queens they started generating within a couple weeks of adding the powder. So it's like they the powder amped them up somehow. They got excited, started propagating. The hive nearly doubled in size. And that's compared to the hive right next to it, maybe eight inches away. So they all had the same resources, and the numbers were the same to start with. So we did that one time on that hive, and then on beehive number one. So we, we ended up having to split beehive number one into multiple other hives, which is where we started getting our additional colonies. And then some of the queens, if I didn't get out there in time, they'll swarm. So if they start, it's called superseding. The, the colony will get too large. They'll make a new queen. She'll fly away with half of the, the bees and start a new colony. And if you get there and time it right, 
and they swarm in a nearby tree like they did in our case, I'll grab a ladder, a new beehive, and just go out there and just shake the tree branch and the whole bee ball, it's called, it's about the size of a basketball, with, you know, 10 or 20,000 bees, will just drop down into the box, you throw a lid on it, and the queen should be in the middle of that ball because you wait until that swarm lands, otherwise they're, they're flying around. What they're doing is mating in the air. And then the queen will land on wherever she decides, and the bees will swarm around her, mostly the drones, but some workers. And then that's what's called the bee ball, the swarm that I'll catch. And, and that started, for example, beehive number three and four. So, And then later in the season, we did the same shungite powder test on one of those hives, um, let's say number four, and it did the same thing. It propagated queens. We had to split hives again, and, and not in the numbers that the other hives did. So we're still working it out, but if I put the powder at the entrance, I'm going to get Shungite queens from that hive, and that's that's happened every time thus far. That's an interesting thing. Now that's that's a bit like um, like uh, uh, pearls, you know, putting sand in the. Yeah. Uh, so the the powder does seem to supercharge them. The powder makes a huge difference. In fact, I've had to stop putting it out there because uh, I'm getting too much expansion. I'm getting too many hives, and they won't have the time left in the year to get up to the numbers to keep themselves warm during the winter, which is why I condensed a couple hives. But the powder, yeah, it, we're going to prep all winter long building multiple hives um, so that we're ready for it, and we're going to just crank it up and, and see what happens in the spring. But they're definitely make queens out of that powder. Wow. So, uh, what, I mean, in, in general, so, uh, it, you, you start with your nook. How, how long's the cycle usually to get to your first queenage, as it were? Okay. <laughs> Whatever the, the, <laughs> the correct technical terms might be. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it, it, actually that queen could stay for several years in that nook. It depends on how healthy she is and whether the other bees have accepted her. It just kind of depends on her genetics, but they'll, it's about a three week cycle, so, She'll stay all by the nook. They'll stay in there for maybe a month until the numbers start coming. So she'll she'll lay the eggs. They'll go through the larval stage, and the workers will start pr- being produced. And then as the numbers get more, you'll see them what's called bearding outside of the entrance of the hives. It'll actually look like a beard um, on the outside, just thousands of bees because there's nowhere for them to go. And then you know, well, I better give them more room so they can get inside. And then you start adding the supers, which are those the boxes. They're called honey supers. Um, and then you go from there. If you don't give them room to expand, they're going to do what I'd mentioned earlier was called superseding, and they're going to think, well, too many of us, let's make another queen. So they'll get the, they'll get the royal jelly, which they make themselves, the worker bees, feed it to a, a larva, extend that cell out larger so it actually looks like a peanut. It's about two or three inches long, about two inches. And the queen, and they'll keep feeding her the royal jelly, which no other bee gets, and that turns her into a queen bee. And then basically as she hatches, Hopefully she hatches alone so she can get out and take the bees and go swarm somewhere. But if there's many of them at once, they'll fight in there and then the, you know, the, the winning queen will take over the colony. But it, I'll get in there and take the, the little peanut cells out and stick them in an empty colony. And that way you can expand your colony that way. All right. And then uh, so within this peanut shaped thing, there's like a queen and, and a few drone eggs or something like that. Mm-hmm, yeah, in that peanut, there's just the queen herself, and oh. I'll have it open just enough. Yeah, and they'll, 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 they actually make it in their head, the um, royal jelly, and it's a mixture of enzymes and, and other things, and feed it to her, and it's, it has extra vitamins, and that'll force her basically to turn into a queen bee, where the other cells will be left alone, and they'll be either drones or female worker bees, and the drones are the males, the worker bees are the females. All right, so uh question from Vanessa, do you also collect the royal jelly? I mean, does it mean if you if you're eating royal jelly, does that mean some poor queen has to suffer <laughs> um there's we don't collect it. there are people that do um no because there's ways you can make the bees trick them into thinking a whole uh, a queen frame it's called is full of queens, but it's not, so you can harvest the jelly if you want to. I don't do that. Some people take it as a supplement. Um, I, I believe just having the bees keep most of their stuff for themselves, even, the, even again, the honey, we keep most of it on them. But you can move the royal jelly around and actually turn other cells into queens and just by dabbing the jelly in there. So it's just another way of making queen cells. This is fascinating. Yeah, see, even without the shungite stuff, uh, we, we're learning lots about bees here. So uh, 
we, you know, I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll be putting this on YouTube, and so, uh, so there'll, there'll be quite an exposure to it. Yeah, it's a good way to get started with the bees is now that you know that the shungite helps so much, you can possibly avoid all of these colony collapse disorders and the, and the various mites and sicknesses. And like I said, just get in contact with cosmic reality and they'll sh- send you the shungite for free. So she will. Um, K girl is asking, do they spray chemtrails where you live? Oh yes, they do. Um, they have chemtrails all of the time. So that's, that's another reason we like having the Shungite there because of the environmental factor. It, it definitely helps with environmental radiation. As I mentioned earlier, I have a Geiger counter. So I've, I go out there periodically and take readings. Um, because we're on the West Coast, I'm a little worried about Fukushima and I, I know the numbers are putting out or are skewed. We'll just say. So I, I was concerned about that causing issues with the bees, but the Shungite's really taking care of that as well. As I take readings up near the hives, I'm getting zeros, and then you can back off when I'm talking about the Geiger counter um, and the EMF readers and back up maybe 100 feet or so. It just kind of depends, um, and that's I'll start picking up readings. So it's it's neutralizing what's around the hives, which is why I like them. So the percentage of the time of the bees' lives that they're in the hive, I know they're safe. And then the ones that fly away with shungai pattern on their legs, I see it as like their own little pendant on you know wrapped around their legs, so they've got the shungai protection as well, and it seems to be paying off. But there are chemtrails. There's no doubt about that. Hang on. Did you say the bees have little pendants? Well, yeah. <laughs> I look at it that way. The powder, because it's such small, so small, it kind of collects on their legs, and you can see oh, it I see. <laughs> in their hair. Yeah. So they, <laughs> however you want to term it, but yeah, they fly around with little shungite nuggets on themselves. Decorated, I hope. Lovely. Um, there. Where's the? Where's that question gone? Um, but, da, 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 da. Oh yes, bees' favorite color. Um, do bees, uh, like the colors purple and yellow? Uh, they do. They, they're yellow especially. The purples and blues, they get a little excited. Um, so they get a little, little hyperactive. Again, it's relative to your bees and the breed you have. Uh, the colors, I wouldn't give too much thought to the color other than, let's say you had like six, eight, ten hives right next to each other. They, they do clearly see colors, so you want to maybe distinguish between your hives and paint them a different color so they don't get confused and have that robbing issue I mentioned earlier where a bee from number one hive lands in number three, and they'll know if it's a foreign bee and because they'll think, you know, maybe it's a robbing situation and, and they'll start fighting. So it's the color is more for just distinguishing between the hives is, would be the reason. So it's uh, um, a – my radio – I have a little radio transmitter that, uh, oh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, ah, oh, that's right. I've, it's got a bit of tension on the, re- there we go. Tension on the cable. There, I can hear myself again. Um, there was, uh, there was another question, uh, um, I see oh, yeah. one on ear infections with honey. Ear infections, yes. Um, yes, you, what about, you could definitely do that. Mm-hmm. How would you, how would you uh, apply it just like, um, I don't know. Warm, you know, add add some to hot water or something and steam it or something. Steam it. No. <laughs> Actually, um, because of its antimicrobial and antibiotic and antifungal um properties, I would just get a Q-tip and just dab it on there and just put it directly on on the wound. We've done it on everything from you know mosquito bites to to open wounds. You can do it on to burns to it's just directly. I wouldn't even water it down. Now in your eyes. Do your research on that online, whomever. But it, it, we're watering it down, maybe a, a drop of honey to four or five drops of water. It just it just depends. And then shake that real well, and then use that for the cataracts and whatnot. But there's there's various ways of doing it. But I would use it as far as in the ears, just directly. Fabulous in the ears. Ah, oh, yeah. Uh, no, we asked about chemtrails, didn't we? Yes. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, energy is saying you should, you could be giving classes online about this. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly. I mean, it's always good to speak to somebody who's uh, enthusiastic about what they're doing. Sure. Yeah. And there's a lot to this. So there's a lot to learn. Um, and we're still learning as we go, finding out all new things to do with it. Now, if we talk about the honey on various ailments, it's, it's working for that. It's, and most honey thing with honey, 
You want to make sure it's organic and treatment free. So when I say treatment free, I mean, you don't want to give chemicals in your beehives that will take care of these mites and diseases and um, nosema, it's called, because that transfers into the honey. And they don't really tell you that. So if you go to Walmart and buy your honey, they're not going to say, well, this is cut with 50% high fructose corn syrup. And by the way, to take care of the mite issue, we put these strips in there, they're called, that, that off-gas this chemical. And you don't really want that, obviously, because it's going to transfer into the honey and and then into yourself. So people, they're finding glyphosate, which is the Roundup weed killer, in I think it's 100% of honeys that they've tested. So that's not a good sign. So that's another reason why you want to go all organic and treatment-free just to keep all that bad stuff out and then stay raw, which is unpasteurized. So I don't heat the honey because if you do that, it kills the good enzymes, which is what you want in the honey. So there's no point in really heating it. Oh, I see. So how do you get that last bit out? <laughs> you, 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 surely you have to separate it and filter it to get the, the, uh, the honey out of the wax. Oh, okay. I'll explain that. Yeah, for the extraction process, when, I, when I've been mentioning frames, so if you open up the beehive, there's ten frames, um, probably a foot or so long, that the, they build the honeycomb on, and then in the comb they'll put the honey, and then they'll cap it with a wax. So I'll take out this frame, and you get a, a knife basically, scrape off or tear off the honey caps, and you put it in an extractor, which is just a centrifugal, um, just. A box, you set the frames in sideways or so vertical and you spin it. And it basically, as the frames are pointing outward, it'll spin the honey out. You'll flip the frames around, get the other side of the honey and pull it out that way so you don't damage the honeycomb. I don't like um, damaging the honeycomb because the bees have to rebuild that. So if you just do the extraction the way I'm saying, leave the honeycomb, they get to refill it and they'll refill it that much faster rather than, you know, damaging the comb or whatnot. So the, it's, the comb isn't really in the wax. When when it's filtered out, we don't do much filtering, just a real light one, meaning leave the particulates in there. You just want the big chunks of wax out, but you want the pollen, you want the the enzymes, you want all the goodness that's in there. It's a living food. So we don't do much in the way of filtering at all. Um, if you look at yours, hold it up to a light, you'll see real small particulates in there, and that's all the good stuff you want. So if you go and buy the Walmart one or whatnot, look in there, it'll look completely clear without those little specks that are inside of it. But you want the specks if you're using it for any kind of beneficial purpose other than putting sugar in your system. Uh-huh. So but uh so you can make stuff out of just about everything. Um <laughs> it's uh what do you is there a recycling thing that you can do with them as well? Is, I mean like are there parts of parts of the the honey that are unusable or unsellable that is mixed with wax and like do they kind of re-extract the honey out of that? Mm, yeah, actually, there's no waste whatsoever hmm. um, because if you when I as I extract the honey out of these um, frames, I'll set the frames out and the bees will find them and they'll go there and they'll pull out the residual honey that you didn't get out from the centrifugal turning of the frames. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'll pull that mm-hmm, and they'll move it into there. And if you leave the frames out long enough, they'll actually just take the honeycomb off of there, which is the wax, and move it into their, their hive or their stain, and so there's no waste at all. Um, it's all, it's all moved over, so, no, it's, it works real well. What fabulous creatures they are. Fabulous. I mean, they, uh, and like you said before, I mean, esoter- esoterically, like you said, the bee is the only insect we get food out of. Um, they, they're not, um, you know, they are built with a sting, but they're not in, inherently aggressive. It's purely for self-defense, which is like no, they don't want to sting you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's a really it's a lot, and you know, it's always a last resort thing, isn't it? They 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 they'll only use that sting as a last resort. Um, so there's certain kind of ethical things about bees, isn't aren't there? Yeah, like I mentioned at the very beginning, they're bouncing, if they're, if they're in an agitated mood or something's going on or they've been robbed or attacked by a mouse or something, they'll do that bouncing off your forehead because, like you just mentioned, they don't, well, they're not wanting to sting you because they're going to die if they sting you and the stinger pulls out of them. So they don't want to do that. So it, then, as we were talking earlier with that, the person who had a neighbor that was concerned, maybe she was concerned about being stung. Well, there's bees everywhere anyway. So if she was going to get stung, she's going to get stung, but bees don't want to sting you. If you're getting stung, 
It's because you're up near their hive and you don't know it, or you've stepped on them, or you're agitating them somehow. They won't just come up and randomly sting you. So they, they're they really calm creatures. Mm-hmm. We haven't had um, issues with them stinging any of our animals um, or us around here. It's just it's just not a problem. Any issues with neighbors either. And with fifty thousand bees in each hive, times eight, you know you got some bee numbers. That's just my hives, not to mention the wild ones. Yeah, uh, sorry, I was just uh, grabbing a cup of tea. Hang on, <laughs> be back in a minute. Oh sure, I'll, I'll just talk for a minute then about the queens because as the queens. When we back to the powder, when we put the powder on those hives, the queens, they probably made six queens at a time inside of there. So they saw that they were going to have, they were growing so fast, so well that they didn't just make one additional queen. They made several and it was, it was about six, I'd say. And, uh, the, the second hive we put the powder on. So that showed a big, um, big difference in their numbers there. And did it, was it the, was the cycle? You know, did it happen faster or was it the same speed, just with higher numbers or higher intensity? It was all the above in numbers and intensity and the speed was, it was, it was like it happened that day. So as I put the powder out there, you can see them instantly getting excited and they're going through it. They start walking around. And then if you count back in the, because there's certain days, it's actually timed by the day within about a two day time frame when the queen is going to hatch. Uh, from when she has started, and they start feeding the larva the royal jelly. So you know when it's going to happen. And if I count back on the days, it has always started on the day of giving the powder. So for whatever reason, that just sent the bees into overdrive, and they think, well, we have all the resources, we're happy, we're going to make new queen bees and, and propagate from there. And then the numbers, even after, let's say the hive gets away, or the swarm gets away from me, and they're out in the, the apple tree nearby, the numbers left are still plenty to keep that initial colony going and they start propagating queens again. So it's been a never ending cycle all this summer, which was not the case in the previous year. It was, I, I don't even know the numbers to compare, but maybe one queen last year was made. And I I've lost count of the queens this year. So it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Lovely. All right. So a uh, question from Lizzie. I love bumblebees and um, I too, JP, love bumblebees, and uh, there's a little um, bumblebee nest just beneath my shed. Uh, do you have them too? And are they good at making honey? What does it? What's what's the the, the relationship of bumblebees to bees? Um, nothing other than the competition. We do have the bumblebees, and there's a lot of them. And there's a uh, people are seeing a lot more of those now too because of the the honeybee population numbers going down. So the bumblebees are able to propagate but no they don't make honey um the honeybee and there's i don't remember the numbers on it there's hundreds of types of honeybee but no the bumblebees don't make um hives per se where they store honey it's just going to be the various breeds of honeybee that would do that and there's they don't fight they'll they'll land on the same flower together i'll watch them out here so they're really the only competition and it's not even for the nectar is the hornets and wasps and that's just from them attacking the bees so everybody gets along really all right. So, yeah, uh, and you, you were also talking about wasps and bees. I always feel that, uh, you know, there's like the night and day thing. There's the butterflies for the day and the moths at night. Um, and uh, whereas, you know, um, <laughs> picnic afternoon, you have a picnic afternoon and who turns up but the army is of angry, hungry wasps. Yeah, the wasps are meat eaters. So you'll actually, if I'm sitting in front of the hives, because I'll go out there often, just just kind of sit with the bees and enjoy them, um, and just see how they're doing. You can see the wasps come by, and they won't they won't land on the hive itself and and mess with the 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 living bees. Often you'll see them down in the ground under the beehives, rummaging through the corpses because as bees die in the hive, there'll be various bees have different jobs in there, and some of them are. Um, they'll push out the dead ones and they'll just kind of shove them off the edge of the hive. So you'll get a, an accumulation of those under the hives if you have a hive for any amount of time. And that's what the hos, hos, the hornets and wasps are going for rather than the, the living bees. All right. So it's a sort of recyc- bee recycling process that they actually give their bodies to the rest of the uh, insect community. And they definitely do that. And I, I think it keeps them from coming after the living bees. So as long as there's enough down there for them, and that, well, 
the thing is the bees are healthy enough to fight off the wasps too because if they're weak and they have mites on them or they have a sickness, which we did see all of the above last year, and you could just see the, the hornets and wasps land on the hive, grab a bee, and start fighting it. So I've, I've seen all of this. That was before the shungite. So now I'm not really sure I attribute it, but that's not going on. They're just going for the weaker or, or like I said, the dead bees. Oh, that's interesting. Ah, so, so good. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sold on the idea that Shungite is gonna, is gonna improve your bees. What, what other things do you think, um, uh, that the Shungite honey might be useful for? I mean, it's, honey is really useful and it never goes off, does it? No, it, they've recently found some. They used to put it in, um, mummies and I think it was about 4,000 years old they found some and they, they put it inside and it's still edible. Oh, it was crystallized, of course, but that's one of the tests for real honey. If your honey crystallizes, you know it's real. If it doesn't, you know it's fructose corn syrup or some other percentage of an additive. Um, but the honey, as far as it's it, – okay, I'll put it this way. Honey is programmable, as I know many of your listeners know. So your intent will pass into the honey. So if you're using it for your ears to heal an issue in there, I would program it with your intent for that for that purpose, or if you're going to put it on MRSA on your leg or foot or whatever, use it and program it with your intent for that. That makes a difference. Um, I understand that's that's not for everybody. But for those who understand or are aware of that, it's the other 50% of of the coin is uh, programming the honey, the shungite honey, and it makes a difference on that aspect as well and internally. So if you if you digest it, we have people putting a few drops in their morning, we'll call it energy drink. Um, and just kind of rationing it out that way um, and feeling the differences there. So it's really relative to, to each person on on what you're aware of and how to use it. If, if you understand the programming of it and use it, it definitely makes a difference. Ah, fascinating. So um, no problem with the African bees. Big problem in Florida. Uh, a big problem in Florida with them, they Africanize the regular bees and they get very aggressive, says Kegel. They do. Um, my father lives in Arizona and he was actually attacked by them this year. We're going to take some of our and get some of our Shungite queens down in there and see if we can't uh, affect the genetics of whichever of the Africanized bees hives we can get or colonies down there and find them. So we've got people that we're going to get, they're going to get a beehive of the Africanized bees. We're going to get them a Shungite queen bee and see if we can't genetically because it's only a few week time frame before the genetics of the bees turn over. They only live so long. And then we'll, we'll see if we can affect them that way. And so that's, that's going to be an ongoing experiment for next spring. And, uh, and I'll post updates on that as well. So we'll see how that helps with that. Fabulous. Now, um, okay. Well, we're about 20 minutes out of the, uh, until the healers show. I, I wonder, I wonder what they'll, they're going to make of it. He, uh, Frank, the, uh, the guy who leads the, uh, the next show. Always ask me, uh, what, what was I talking about, uh, in, in mind. So, uh, it's uh, going to be a very interesting conversation after this. Uh, the, uh, the show is about, uh, healings and meditations. Oh, that should be interesting. Yeah. Honey will fit right in with that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, honey, it, um, it has, like you say, uh, it lasts a long time. Um, have you, all right, what's, here's the one, what's the weirdest use of honey that you've come across so far? And would Shungite honey make any difference? Okay, um, I guess weirdest is relative, of course, but I've, I've got, I've gotten lots of feedback behind the scenes and, and email and messaging and whatnot. A lot of it I haven't gotten online yet. Um, we've got people using, as you mentioned, for, for, for during meditations and whatnot. So it's, it's helping people, it, again, depending on who we're talking about, but activate themselves. So we've had people use it on their third eye to, to help that. Um, and again, I think a lot of it is the programming. So if you get that in there and then have the mixture and your intent is a lot of it, it's going to help in a lot of ways. So I guess, you know, again, relative intent, but that would be a little bit of a unique thing that people wouldn't really think of honey being used for. Um, and, a couple of people for diabetes. You don't usually think honey, diabetes, sugar, that's what you want to avoid, but they're, they're getting good results with that as well. And until I get more feedback on that, I don't really want to post too much until I have something I can compare it to, but it's really good feedback um, for those two uses. 
and then lots of wounds. And then the eye was another one that had been brought to my attention uh, about the, the helping of cataracts. So there's there's various ways of that. And it's, I believe it's the the sugar portion of it that's helping eat away the cataracts, which is you know a, a layer on your eye, so it kind of gets rid of that. But those are some unique uses for the honey. Well, that's interesting. Um, actually, uh, in the G's, uh, the, at this moment, she says, currently I'm on a no sugar diet, no refined sugar, no natural sugar, no maple syrup, no cane sugar, no fruits, no sugar, period. And this is to heal her insulin resistance that was heading her directly for type 2 diabetes, as you just mentioned. Shungite honey, how would that affect my situation? Any ideas? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Just so you know where my computer crashed, so I don't see the questions. But on oh, that that's... one, yeah, just, just so you're aware of that. Um, the, we do have someone with type 2 diabetes that's using it for that reason. And these people are working with their doctors, so they've mentioned it to them. They're, be it the cataracts or the type 2 diabetes. I don't have much feedback on that particular, um, uh, testing yet. So I don't have, so I don't have much really to say. Um, but it is being used on that. Now the wounds and the topical care, there's, there's lots of feedback on that, how it's, it's, Basically taking care of whatever the antibiotics aren't getting rid of, be it the, the MRSA or just various, you know, wound issues. Uh, MRSA. Can you explain that to our, some, to our, uh, audience who don't know what MRSA is? Sure. That's, that's actually found everywhere. So it's in the environment. But if you have a weakened immune system for a lot of reasons, chemtrails or just for health issues, um, it's, it's, in the environment, so basically anybody can get it any time. If you have a weakened immune system, it's just going to be an infection that gets away from you. So it can it can get really bad. There's it's anti. I'm, I'm trying to get the term here, but most antibiotics don't work on it. So it's it's a real problem. At least over here in the U.S., it's a problem. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's you know, worldwide everywhere yet, but because of the lack of usable antibiotics for us nowadays. Um, they're just having issues killing it. And we've, we've tried it with colloidal silver because I make that as well. In fact, I've even given the bees that, um, to test that on them. But just putting the honey on the MRSA because of its antibacterial and viral and, and all the beneficial pro- um, properties of it, it, it cures the wounds. It closes them up. It's, we have great results with that ourselves. Very good. So it, it's a general, I always find, you know, here's the thing, you know, um, the first time I get a sore throat, the first thing I reach for is the honey, stick a bit of honey in a, cause I know it's gonna coat, um, with a, a protective layer, it's gonna, and, and make my, uh, it'll, it'll soothe things as well. So, presumably that's gonna work on other parts of the, of the anatomy that are, are sort of raw and rough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because of the antiviral and bacterial and antibiotic properties, sure, it'll get rid of all the bad stuff in there and give your body basically the chance to heal itself is what's really going on. On that whole MRSA part, it's just basically stopping that so you can heal yourself is is what's going on. Exactly, because it's, you know, healing ourselves is how, how we get there. Uh, from Tim in Australia, Derek, reports of bee numbers declining. Do you think this is mainly due to pesticides? All right. In, in my opinion, it's half of that. So it's 50% that and then, well, you know, probably different numbers, but a portion that and then the other portion is going to be the, um, the EMF spectrum. So the, the Wi-Fi, the cell phones. We've done various tests on that, having cell phones up to them, even trying to record my video. Um, they'll, they'll respond to that. So it's a combination. You'll read articles where they'll say it's, it's all around up. They're spraying the fields and it's killing all the bees. Well, yeah, it is. It's not helping the bees, that's for sure. It's a portion of it. But the other portion is just the spectrum, the the various frequencies we have being blasted is from from everywhere, which is where we why we kind of took it on the whole Faraday cage logic. Um, and that's just kind of a side test we're doing uh, with protecting the bees from that because I've had the, the cell phones out there and, and the Wi-Fi, and, and I can directly see it affecting the bees. So it's it's a combination between pesticides, the, the various frequencies we're being bombarded with and and i know it's also you know the aluminum they're in the chemtrails so that's affecting because that's coming down in the plants so it's it's a combination interesting interesting so yes manuka is produced by bees that visit the tea tree oil source plant 
Are there any other... Um, so, okay, so part of the conversation in the last show was about cannabis. So, um, Shanghai bees and cannabis, do they produce... Have, have, have you? Do you know anybody who has bees that... Um, that, that visit cannabis and do they can you make cannabis honey okay well <laughs> that's kind of an interesting question because that just came up in the past couple of weeks i have a friend here in washington state because cannabis is legal he's actually a, a grown a distributor um legally to the dispensaries around here so he's we're going to get connected here in a few days and what he's going to do is take my shungite and he's, we're going to get the seeds. We're going to start from the seeds because he has, uh, specific strains, um, because they all be watched here from the seed up if you, if you grow the marijuana and you sell it. So the state's really involved. Um, so we're going to have it around that and start from the seed stage and grow the plant and use the shungite water and powder in the plant and just basically go through the whole life cycle and see how it affects the plant. And then he'll have that tested and, um, we'll, we'll see how that works. But as far as the honey, I haven't really worked in a way to, to maybe bring that into that. That's interesting though. You could, he had mentioned maybe, cause he does something, some kind of like a, a cannabis or CBD butter mixture for cancer patients. So what he wants to do is get the honey. And I think that's what you're, you're kind of getting at is work that aspect into the honey. So we'll try that as well. Um, it really should be just infusing it in the honey. It shouldn't be too, too hard a process to do. So. No, but we are looking at that, so yeah. that's interesting. And then the whole plant from the yeah. like I said, the seed up. Um, well, I mean, if, if say you were able to grow in um, a grow dome or a, you know a massive uh, poly tunnel, um, or your cannabis plants, and you have a, a, a beehive in there, would the bees feed on? Would would that uh, work? You know, and so that the bees' oh. honey was actually made from the pollen and the, the nectar of the uh, cannabis plant. Oh, I see. No, because the the plant wouldn't go all the way to to flower per se to where you'd get nectar off of it. Something the bee would be able to grab and take back. So no, the the plant would never really get to that stage. Um, it's it's it just it's oh they harvest them before that. Oh, I see. Yeah, 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 exactly. So it's not really something to transfer over. So we're trying to introduce the shungite to the plant, and then he'll do his testing and whatnot and see how that maybe affects the outcome on the on the properties of the the marijuana for cancer patients and, and whatnot. So we don't really have any, you know, results on that yet, of course. All right. Okay. Uh, Cause you know, like I said, Manuka honey is tea tree plant, um, uh, bees that, that visit the plant of the tea tree, uh, uh, thing, <laughs> the tea tree tea, uh-huh. the tea tree bush. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. And that's um, what you use. Go ahead. Yeah, and and the, so the honey is infused uh, automatically by you know by virtue that they were visiting the plant. So I was just wondering if the, if there could be a cannabis version of that, but there isn't because you say, as you say, they don't get to the the to the nectar producing bit because they're off to the uh, mm-hmm. off to the dealers. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And they're getting mostly from the trees um that the manuka honey they're getting they're getting the enzymes because it's called propolis so think bee glue if there's a if you put a honey box on top of another box you start stacking your hive there'll be little gaps if they're not perfectly fit and they'll make propolis the bees will and they'll pack it in there and that sells and that's for wounds as well um lots of medicinal um benefits there but it's really just the sap from the tree mixed with their own enzymes and they put it in there so they're not really taking a lot from the tree putting it in the honey it's good honey, Manuka, but it's it's kind of being built up. Really, as long as you have organic, treatment-free honey, all the bad stuff out of it, and you don't process it um, or pasteurize it, any honey is going to be medicinal. So, to that benefit, it's just it's so. Uh, it's it's not just the teacher tree that does that. So my point is that organic, untreated honey will heal you just as well as that Manuka honey, but just keep it chemical-free. Ah, like shungaihoney.com. So, exactly. tell everybody how to find your honey, where to buy it, can it be sent abroad, uh, can you send it to Australia, um, is there, uh, can you get the, have you got any t-shirts, uh, what kind of merch you got, just roll ahead with it, Derek. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, you can find us at, at shungaihoney.com, and on there we have the, we do have the honey available now, um, and we also had that Shanghai Honey Skin Balm I'd mentioned. Um, we've even made some 
some of the beeswax candles on there mixed with shungite powder. And those, if you're if sensitive to energy at all, those are something that are, are I find real interesting. Um, so if you're if you're in a meditation, you can you can make them yourself as well. Um, but the shungite candles will definitely give off a great energy for that. And we do ship overseas now. Yours was actually the the test package to see if it showed up okay, and then everybody kicked it down my door. So it all worked out there. And we'll we'll ship we'll, we'll try and ship worldwide and until we get refused or turned down. Um, it looks good so far. So we are able to send everywhere. We're going to have a limited supply because, again, we only extract so much honey, but it is available now. Um, and we're really, if there's anybody interested in, regardless of the country, who want to try a Shungai beehive, again, CosmicReality.net will give you the Shungai and we'll give you some some questions and, and paperwork to monitor. So meaning what to watch for to see this change or whatnot on your beehives and, and help us with the project and, and you'll get some of that great Shanghai honey yourself. Uh, I would certainly uh, recommend some. And uh, so uh, Chris Greenheart is asking, uh, could you do a quick review about um, your ver- the various things you've, uh, the various mods you've done to your bees? So, for instance, Shanghai Stone on the front porch. Can you can you just kind of run through them once again for us? Sure. Yeah. No problem. Um, so to start with, we'll get the the brood box at the bottom one. So you start with the nook again, and then. Initially, we'll just put the three, and we found that three nuggets is the key. So we have them all together, and there's photos up on the various Facebook um, sites where we have this project going where you can see where we're putting them. But we'll put three nuggets in the right side entrance, all touching. And then if I'm doing – and after that, we'll, well, beforehand, I should say, I'll get just your standard external um, enamel paint and mix in – it's about a third of a teaspoon of the Shungai powder into that – and then we'll mix it up real well and paint the outside. Again, just the outside of the hives because you don't want chemicals or paint on the inside. Uh, so we'll have that Shungai barrier on the outside, and that's just on um, some of the hives right now. But the nuggets are on all three hives. So that's the key part initially is the nuggets, to have those three. And then anything above and beyond that, we're just doing additional testing on, um, for example, the powder. So if you want to expand your hive, I, what I, at this point I would say, Almost don't do the powder unless you're ready to expand your hives because of the results I'm getting with that. So many queens being made so quickly and nowhere to put them, assuming you wanted to keep them, expand your apiary. But so I would, that's where the powder comes in. And then I mentioned the pyramid, but that's on a whole nother, not really on this project I'm doing. That's just on one hive. I'm just trying to see if it has, um, or see the various results on that. So it's the nuggets, the powder, and then we've added the paint on as we add more boxes all. I'll, I'll paint those as well. But the nuggets are really the key test we're doing. And then, and I had all of these results, <clears throat> excuse me, with just the nuggets. And then the expansion of the queens came into play when I added the powder. So really somebody just, just trying to get into Shungai beehives, I would, the nuggets are the main focus. Get those on the front and they'll, the bees will sh- spend a lot of time just walking around them. It's really odd. I thought they were just walking around to see, you know, should we get rid of them or whatnot, but it's been months now. And they just like to hang around, around the nuggets. That's brilliant. And um, let's see if there's any more, uh, any more questions. So we've done that. And, uh, yeah, um, lots of yeah. Get some, get some Shungai from Cosmic Reality, uh, CosmicReality.net, I think, or is it dot com? One of them, or both. No, it's, it's dot. Yeah, it's dot net, and I can be reached on. Um, it's called Shungai Beehives. It's a, a Facebook page we have going, and I can answer any questions, and they can follow along as we do it and see what's happening, ask their own questions, and get involved there as well. You know, it's it's the uh, the the idea of like a global experiment with this. You know, if you see, could, because uh, you've got a lot of samples. You know, you could you could collect a lot of. Uh, yeah, in, in terms of doing research, there's lots of beekeepers and, uh, sending a small packet of Shanghai out to them would be, uh, you know, wouldn't be an expensive experiment to do. Uh, do you, uh, do you yeah. belong to communities, um, like online communities, uh, who, who discuss this kind of thing? I do. Uh huh. And we actually started a couple of our own. It's the, the trouble there is, you know, trying to tie the two together. So maybe we have, We'll just say spiritual person who understands Shungite and then maybe a beekeeper. So it's getting them to understand this does make a difference here. But when I show them the honey and they actually taste it because they think, 
you know, my honey, their honey, that is, is the best. It can't get any better. And then I'll show them the Shungite honey. And then they know the difference. It's tangible right there in their face. And they go, oh my gosh, it's phenomenal, the difference. So, and then I'll give them a sample that way. And that's, but once it's in your face and your, and your hands, you can try it and taste it or put it on a wound. There's, they're, they're going to want Shungite hives. And it's not something that, that just I'm doing. It's like you said, go worldwide. Anybody can have a Shungite hive, um, and just get their own. So, uh, any final messages, um, before we, uh, we close the show, Derek? Um, no, I would just, I would, I would say don't hesitate. Anybody who has the inclination to get bees, don't be scared. It's not tough. You don't need years of experience. Um, just watch various YouTube videos out there from beekeepers and maybe join your local beekeeper association and ask questions, but, but don't hesitate, get involved, get the bees out there and, and you'll have a lot of fun and you'll get a lot of benefits and not to mention the great honey. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Derek Condit, Shanghai Honey. Remember, don't be sharp. Don't be flat. Just be natural. Good night.